committee will come to order. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's hearing, Tsunami Warning, Preparedness and Interagency Cooperations, Lessons Learned. I would also like to welcome uh, Ranking Member Tierney, members of the subcommittee, and those of you watching via live, uh, live on the webcast at oversight.house.gov. Thank you all for joining us. I uh, appreciate your patience. We have a lot of votes and things happening on Capitol Hill today, and uh, I appreciate the distance that, that many of you traveled, uh, some short, some rather long. Uh, we appreciate it. This is an important topic and uh, appreciate your participation. Apologies in advance if we get called out for votes. Uh, also, uh, we have a markup going on in the committee I am participating uh, next door and may need to, to go to that as well. But nevertheless, we are glad to hear this is an important topic that literally would affect millions of people's lives. And hopefully it will never come to that. Um, hopefully it is just a, a lesson in preparedness. But when that disaster, uh, if, and hopefully it doesn't ever happen, uh, what the work that you are doing now and the preparation is, is vital to our country and, and the lives and safety of so many uh, Americans and, and people around the world. 50,000 people were dead or went missing. Millions more were suddenly homeless in 11 countries. Our Pacific states and territories are also within reach of the damaging effects of tsunamis. According to the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, the contiguous United States has suffered from tsunamis originating in Chile, Japan, Russia, and Alaska. In 2009, America's Samoa was struck by a tsunami that killed 22 people, and that is why we are here today. This subcommittee will examine the extent to which the Federal Government is capable of de determining the threat from tsunamis can issue timely and effective warnings about a tsunami, and has the plans in place to respond to a tsunami. Also, the subcommittee will look at how successful the Federal Government is in helping local and State authorities develop tsunami-resilient communities and how these entities conduct public outreach. We also, will also examine lessons learned from Japan and the extent to which they can be applied. Taxpayers have invested substantial resources to ensure U.S. preparedness. The Federal entities principally responsible for this mission are the U.S. Geological Survey, NOAA, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Career officials from these agencies are here today. We have also invited their, their State counterparts to testify about collaboration with the Federal Government. A representative from the State of Alaska is here with us today. The States of Oregon, Washington, and Hawaii have submitted their statements for the record. We are only disappointed that California chose not to participate. I ask for unanimous consent that those statements be placed in the hearing records. Without objection, so ordered. Look, here, look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses. Now I would like to uh, recognize the distinguished ranking member, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, witnesses, for being with us here today. I am going to ask that my statement in its entirety uh, be placed on the record uh, if there is no objection. There being no objection. Thank you. Objection, so ordered. And the, I just make a couple of quick points in the interest of time here. One is obviously that we stand by the Japanese people and the, during this very difficult time, and uh, we will continue to do that, I am sure. Uh, but also, by all accounts, it would seem to us that the uh, response uh, in this country worked admirably, admirably during the uh, Japanese tsunami situation. So I want to thank all of you and congratulate you on that. According to the interim director of the Emergency Management Association from Oregon, uh, and I quote, the Federal response to this disaster was magnificent, close quote. Uh, so that doesn't buy, uh, belie the fact that we all need to continue to be prepared. We can never be too prepared on that. Uh, and Congress has to make sure that there is adequate support for each and every one of these agencies in all of their responsibilities, but in particular on this topic uh, with respect to the tsunami. So I am a bit concerned when I look at some of the budget proposals being put forward, uh, that they do reduce the budget for a number of the agencies. And I want to hear from the witness at some point during the time whether or not that is likely to impact our ability going forward to be as prepared and ready uh, both to detect and to respond uh, to these incidents. So with that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you again. Thank you. Members will have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. For the record. We will now recognize our, uh, the, our panel. Dr. William Leith, did I pronounce that uh, properly? I hope so, is the Acting Associate Director for Natural Hazards at the U.S. Geological Survey. Ms. Mary Glacken is the Deputy Undersecretary for Operations at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Ms. Nancy Ward is the Regional Administrator for Region 9 of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, Kenneth Mur Murphy is the Regional Administrator, Administrator for Region 10 of the Fe Federal Emergency Management Agency. And Mr. John Madden is the Director of the Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for the State of Alaska. 
Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. If you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witness is answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear your testimony. If you would be so kind as to limit your comments to five minutes. Um, your full record and full statement will be submitted for the record, uh, for the others that uh, will be able to peruse. But if you could keep your verbal comments to five minutes in order to get through this, plus the questioning, we would certainly appreciate it. You should see a nice uh, red light when you get to, to that five minutes. Um, and so we will start with you, Dr. Leith. You are recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting the U.S. Geological Survey to testify at this hearing. The USGS is tasked under the Stafford Act to issue forecasts and warnings for earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and landslides. For tsunami, we provide critical science and monitoring support to NOAA, FEMA, and other agencies. We provide hazard alerts to a broad suite of users, including the general public. The scope of each notification depends on the severity and the extent and possible impact of the event. Our key users include not only FEMA and NOAA, but the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, state transportation and water management agencies, including Utah, for example, local emergency managers, and national and international re disaster response organizations. To monitor earthquakes in the U.S. and abroad, the USGS operates the Advanced National Seismic System and, in partnership with the National Science Foundation, the Global Seismographic Network. ANSS and GSN seismic data are relayed directly to the NOAA Tsunami Warning Centers, enabling them to respond within minutes of a major event. We also participate in the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program, or NTHMP. The USGS invested $2.3 million in fiscal year 2010 in research and assessment activities supporting the goals of the NTHMP. USGS contributes guidance in the preparation of tsunami inundation maps, as well as capabilities to survey coastal and nearshore bathymetry and topography, which, of course, strongly influence tsunami wave heights and inundations. The U.S. West Coast, Hawaii, and the Pacific Territories are all at risk for damage from tsunami generated by earthquakes. Our shores host two subduction zones that are capable of magnitude 9 earthquakes one offshore of Alaska, which last ruptured in 1964, and the other in the Pacific Northwest, known as Cascadia, which last ruptured in 1700. This latter one deserves special mention. Recent investigations of offshore deposits indicate that the zone may have produced magnitude 9 size earthquakes perhaps 20 times in the last 10,000 years. Further research is therefore needed to fully document and assess the earthquake potential in this area. With respect to our southern and eastern shores, the USGS has done extensive research for the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on tsunami history and potential in the Atlantic coast and the Caribbean. These regions have less frequent damaging tsunami than in the Pacific, and a historic tsunami of the size that hit Japan on March 11 are not known. But the historic and geologic record suggests that the tsunami risk here cannot be dismissed. What did we learn from the recent Japanese earthquake and tsunami? On the day of the earthquake, technical coordination between NOAA, the Tsunami Warning Centers, and the USGS National Earthquake Information Center was seamless. Since then, close coordination of post-disaster information and response activities has occurred under the protocols of the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. Also, while tsunami damage and loss of life were heavy in Japan, it appears that the investments made there in monitoring and warning systems, earthquake-resistant construction, public information and preparedness activities actually significantly limited the damage and loss of life before the earthquake. Still, the disaster has taught us that scientists need to thoroughly document the prehistoric record of large earthquakes in order to fully assess their likelihood and consequences. Looking forward, the U.S. can reduce tsunami risks, improve public warning and response in three basic areas. First, continued public education through ongoing efforts uh, 
in the U.S. Pacific nor uh, states and territories, particularly in Hawaii and the Pacific Northwest. Second, the completion of this advanced national seismic system, including the enhancement of networks in the eastern United States and the development of earthquake early warning capabilities, which were in place in Japan and apparently effective. And third, enhanced research into the frequency and effects of prehistoric tsunamis. Our recorded him, uh, history is simply too short to provide adequate probabilities for such rare events. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks, and I would be happy to take any questions you or the committee may have. Thank you. I, I appreciate your comments. Ms. Glockin, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Tierney and other members of the committee. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to testify on this important topic this afternoon. NOAA plays a critical role in ensuring our Nation is warned of many natural and man-made hazards and prepared to respond to these. The March 11th Japanese earthquake and tsunami served as reminders of our vulnerability to these hazards. And as my colleague has just described, um, there, there are major threats uh, in our coastal regions. A rupture along any of these faults could set off a tsunami relatively coast, close to the shore and impact coastal communities in mere minutes. NOAA is working to ensure our Nation is prepared for such potential catastrophes. A comprehensive and effective warning, uh, tsunami warning process requires three parts. First, observations for detection and models to forecast the path and the impact. Secondly, timely and accurate alerts. And perhaps most importantly, community education and awareness to ensure the proper public response to alerts and warnings. Today I want to discuss very briefly how NOAA integrates all three of these components and works with our customers and partners to ensure our Nation is prepared. We provide a host of products and services that minimize the impact of tsunamis from advanced preparedness of coastal communities to detection and warning service to post-event response and recovery efforts. NOAA operates a suite of instruments and tools, including an array of ocean buoys and monitoring stations moored to the seafloor, sea level gauges at the coastline, our polar orbiting satellites are involved, and that of an, and our advanced computer modeling. NOAA's services include around the clock forecast and warning centers and extensive public outreach and education efforts. Within minutes of the Japanese earthquake, NOAA received seismic data from USGS and other partners and issued tsunami warnings and information statements for both domestic and international communities through our two centers in Hawaii and Alaska. Wave data from our deep ocean bu data buoys and coastal data from our tide gauges were relayed via satellites and integrated into tsunami models. Our talented professionals translated this into warnings and forecasts. These alerts and warnings provided lead times of seven hours for Hawaii, four hours for Alaska, and nine hours for the West Coast. Local National Weather Service forecast offices that serve the U.S. coastline issued localized tsunami impact statements. Together, this information helped emergency managers and local officials evaluate the ongoing threat until all the warning and advisories were finally dropped over 36 hours after the initial earthquake. The best warning information, however, is worth little unless those at risk are prepared and ready to respond. To achieve this level of preparedness, NOAA has engaged in an extensive array of outreach and education efforts. We work with our Federal partners with local and State governments through the National Tsunami Hazards Mitigation Program. This program, formed in 1995 and reauthorized by Congress in 2006, works to reduce the impact of tsunamis on the U.S. coastal com communities and includes all 28, 30, 28 U.S. coastal states, territories, and commonwealths. This program stresses the importance of NOAA's Tsunami Ready Program, a voluntary partnership among NOAA, state, and local emergency management agency. It strives to increase the public awareness of the threat that tsunamis pose, improve hazard planning and strengthen warning communication, linking the emergency management community with the public. Currently, there are 83 tsunami-ready communities, and NOAA's goal is to recognize 105 by 2013. We believe that Tsunami Ready and the National Tsunami Hazards Mitigation Program is a model program for how the government at all levels can work together to improve hazard resilience in the United States. 
In summary, the investments made by Congress and the Administration in NOAA's Tsunami Warning System and the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program directly saved lives in the U.S. during last month's Pacific-wide tsunami disaster. Nothing can eliminate the physical threat that tsunamis pose. However, NOAA remains committed to, le to leading U.S. efforts to save lives and property through tsunami preparedness, detection, and forecasting efforts. We will work in partnership to continuously improve our natural hazard services to the Nation. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ward, you are recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Tierney, and the distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am the Regional Administrator for FEMA Region 9. My region encompasses California, Hawaii, Arizona, Nevada, American Samoa, Guam, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. I am pleased to be here alongside Ken Murphy, Regional Administrator for FEMA Region 10, which encompasses Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, and we are honored to be here today. I would first like to say that our thoughts and prayers go out to the people of Japan as they continue to recover from the devastation of the past several weeks. The events in Japan also serve, however, as a reminder of the importance of tsunami preparedness in our own country. While tsunamis occur infrequently, they have the potential to cause major destruction to the coastal communities in several FEMA regions. Because tsunamis present great potential for damage to both people and property, all levels of government must be prepared for the threats associated with them. We in government also have a responsibility to coordinate our preparedness efforts with non-governmental entities, including private sector organizations, nonprofit and faith-based groups, and perhaps most importantly, the individuals and families who live in these potentially affected communities. My written testimony discusses FEMA's catastrophic planning efforts, which both include all hazards approach as a certain hazard specific plans in areas at heightened risk for tsunami. This morning, however, like, or this afternoon, however, I would like to discuss the recent tsunami threat to Region 9 as an example of how FEMA works to support our State and local partners in the event of tsunami threat. Just after 10 p.m., March 9th, FEMA Region 9 was alerted to a magnitude 9 earthquake soon followed by a Pacific-wide tsunami warning. The Region 9 Watch Center immediately alerted Region 9 senior staff and made contact with our National Watch Center. Within the hour, the FEMA Regional Support Team uh, and our Regional Support Coordination Center was activated to a level 1, FEMA's highest activation level. Our Regional On-Call Incident Management Assistance Team was noticed and placed on alert for immediate deployment to a potential tsunami-impacted area. Key Federal agency partners were also more mobilized and directed to report to the RRCC to emergency support function coordination and assets. Immediately following activation of our Regional Response Coordination Center, Region 9 established lines of communication with our States and territorial partners, including FEMA Region 10, as a communication hub for jurisdictions throughout the Pacific. Simultaneous, excuse me, simultaneously in Hawaii, the FEMA Region 9 Pacific Area Office located out in Fort Shafter in Hawaii went operational. The Pacific Area's Office Deputy Director was dispatched to the State of Hawaii Civil Defense Emergency Operations Center and co-located with our State partners throughout the entire incident period. In the aftermath of the tsunami, Region 9 worked closely with Hawaii and California to conduct preliminary damage assessments. These, these PDAs resulted in disaster declarations requests for both Hawaii and California. A disaster declared last week for the State of Hawaii, and California's request is still under review. Similarly, in Region 10, FEMA's activation and coordination with their states resulted in a disaster declaration for the State of Oregon. As is both policy and doctrine at FEMA, we worked closely, very closely with all of our Federal Government partners, including invaluable contribu contributions by both NOAA and the USGS. We also plan, train, and exercise year-round with State, local, tribal, and territorial governments to help this with tsunami and other planning, education, and awareness. As an example, FEMA supports the National Weather Service to pr promote the Tsunami Ready Campaign. We also encourage States and localities to use their grant funding to increase their disaster preparedness. While no coastal community is tsunami proof, we work with the community leaders and emergency managers to reduce the potential for disastrous tsunami related consequences. The events in Japan have also raised important questions as to how a catastrophic earthquake and tsunami might affect our nuclear facilities in surrounding areas. At the direction of Administrator Fugate, we have increased our participation in exercises associated with our nuclear plants. We are focused on conducting exercises that provide a true test of our emergency protocols and capabilities. 
This week, for instance, in San Onofre, California, state emergency experts are leaving, leading a mandated biennial exercise at the Southern California Edison Beachfront Nuclear Power Plant stationed in Orange County, California, a site, I might add, that supports the National Weather Service's tsunami ready designation. As would be the case in any actual event, the NRC and the State have the primary authority. FEMA Region 9 is participating in the exercise both as a player and as an evaluator of how the exercise unfolds. Most importantly, however, we work to instill a commitment to personal preparedness. Uh, April is also uh, Earthquake Preparedness Month, which provide more platform for us to disseminate act. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Murphy, you are recognized for five minutes. I did them both. <laughs> oh, joint standing. My apologies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Mr. Murphy. I appreciate it. That was <laughs> the best one we have heard yet. No offense to this. Mr. Madden, we appreciate the distance that you have traveled here. You are now recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Chairman and Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity. I'm I am the Director of Homeland Security and Emergency Management for the State of Alaska, and I am responsible for confronting the entire range of hazards that nature and humans can inflict on our citizens and economy. We are no stranger to disasters. We have fires, floods, storms, and cold every year. But the seismic hazards of earthquakes and tsunamis give little or no warning and require a different approach to preparedness. In our history are many destructive earthquakes. The largest was the 9.2 earthquake, which generated many tsunamis. It happened on Good Friday in 1964. That killed 131 people in Alaska, Oregon, and California. We believe that tsunami preparedness is an enterprise, a purposeful and industrious undertaking that requires extreme coordination. And the State of Alaska works with many organizations on this enterprise, including several that are here at the table today. We recently conducted the latest tsunami operations workshop in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, for communities throughout the 1,500 miles of the Aleutian Islands, the Alaskan Peninsula, and Kodiak Island. Many of these communities are within the areas that were threatened by the Japanese tsunami. Each community left that workshop with plans on evacuation, emergency operations, and solid understanding of warnings, advisories, and watches, which were put to the test just a few weeks ago. On March 10th, Alaska received almost uh, instant notification of the earthquake and shortly thereafter received the first advisories from the West Coast and Alaska Tsunami Warning Center. This emergency combined four factors that greatly complicated our response. The warnings came in the middle of the night, in winter, in adverse weather, and in isolated communities far remote from each other and from the nearest help. We established voice contact with every community in the warning and advisory area and ensured that community leaders had the information necessary for their local decisions. Alaska was very fortunate that only limited damage occurred in our coastal communities. And during last month's event, the tsunami preparedness enterprise worked as designed overall. The continuous monitoring yielded immediate detection. The computer models de determined the potential for tsunami. The alert and warning centers transmitted the critical information. The deep water buoys provided data to recalculate the estimated arrival times and amplitudes to very high accuracy, and all the State assets were primed and ready to respond as needed. Most importantly, the communities received the information and invoked the plans that were, had been recently validated. The State of Alaska strongly supports this tsunami enterprise and particularly the continued authorization and funding of the National Tsunami Hazard Mitigation Program within, uh, within the Federal Government. Through funding to the States with tsunami risk, the, this program advances preparedness through tsunami-ready communities, sirens, training, exercises, signage, and much more. We also recommend that resilient and redundant communication systems be made the highest priority to ensure continuity of the tsunami warning network. The most critical element of the entire enterprise is public outreach and education. All the science, all the computers, all the warnings are useless if the affected community does not know how to respond to that threat. We must create and sustain a posture of preparedness in each person living or visiting our coastal communities. 
Only through exemplary interagency cooperation can we prepare for this most unpredictable and potentially devastating hazard. With the continued support of Congress, you can provide the partners in this vital enterprise, Federal, State and local governments and the general public, with the means to continue effectively to protect lives and property. Thank you. I appreciate the, the testimony of you all. And, and uh, we will now move to uh, the round of questioning. I am going to recognize myself to start uh, for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Glackin, let us talk about the modeling, because the key to all of this is that chain reaction that all starts with the modeling that says, here it comes. Um, how complete is that? As you look at the United States coastline, including uh, our territories, uh, obviously Alaska and, and Hawaii, are there parts of that that aren't mapped? Are there parts of that? I don't know how to, with the technical way to ask that, but where are the vulnerabilities in the detection models? So uh, it's not all mapped. Uh, this is an area that we have been working on, and in particular using some of the resources that we've gotten from the spectrum sale, which happened uh, after the, the Indonesian tsunami. And we've approached this in dealing with where we know there's uh, risk areas, for example, as has been highlighted, uh, off of Alaska and off of the Cascadia zone there. We have a, a recent report. We've gone to the National Academies of Science to ask for a review of our tsunami warning program overall. One of the things that they have encouraged us to do is, in partnership with our Federal partners and uh, the States, is to do an overall risk assessment across the United States to really have a handle on what the particular challenge areas are. We would like to take that on. It is one of the things that you know, we will be looking at to find ways to resource this. So uh, of our coastline, what percentage is not protect, is not? So um, we are able to issue a tsunami warning for any part of our coastline. So it is not that there would not be a tsunami warning. We will be able to give you a better, where we have the more detailed modeling done, we will be able to give you more information about what the potential impacts will be, how much inundation and things like that. I will have to get back to you with exactly what percentage of all of that. I'll be and and that is the that. curiosity as to where the vulnerabilities are. We have talked a lot about the Pacific, and my, my other part of the question is, what, what about the Atlantic and obviously mm -hmm. the Gulf and whatnot? So, uh, and I don't know if you can speak to that, but well, I think that when you think think about vulnerabilities from this, tsunamis are caused um, primarily by the seismic activity there. They can also be caused by, um, you know landslides underwater, there is more technical term for this, my colleague knows, uh, to do that. And so we, a lot of what we have been doing in partnership is being driven by the seismic assessment of there. So we have done that risk assessment. That has informed how we have put out our monitoring stations, what we call our dart buoys, for, for doing this. So that level is done. To, for us to make more progress, we have to do mapping of you know, the inland areas there so we have better handles on how the water will actually roll up. As a follow-up, I would be very curious, as to, again, where, where the vulnerabilities are. Let, let me go to another part. In your written testimony, you stated that, quote, uh, NOAA provides a host of products and services that minimize the impacts from tsunamis, from advanced preparedness of coastal communities to detection and warning services to post-event response and recovery efforts. What so uh, I can use exactly the example um, for this recent event. One of the things that NOAA does as part of our National Ocean Service is we do um, uh, navigational uh, mapping. So we went into Crescent Harbor um, in California where there had been so much destruction and our ships did surveys there to identify debris that was on the, uh, on the seabed floor and allowed um, the Coast Guard to be able to remove. Uh, we found out where it is. The Coast Guard comes in and removes it. So they were able to open the ports in a timely fashion. And, and maybe we'll go to Mr. Murphy uh, since uh, you have your your perception of concerns about what happens in the in the, in your region how good is this information that you're going to get how is the coordination between the two different agencies uh, I can tell you that it, it's very good, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we totally rely actually not only on NOAA but USGS products 
Uh, and I can tell you from this recent uh, Japanese earthquake and tsunami, uh, everybody that I work with in our states uh, usually are uh, well wired into both the tsunami warning centers. You can also get your own personal alerts on your uh, smartphone, Blackberries, computers. Uh, and, and so I think a lot of that really pays uh, dividends. And uh, I agree with Ms. Clack, and I know that we have reached out to them because we had damage in some of the ports in Oregon, and uh, great partners uh, working together to try and get those ports back open, because there are so many issues where you need NOAA and USGS, Coast Guard, a few other agencies to get these communities in a recovery mode and back operating. So I think as a group of agencies, uh, we really do have to work together pre-event and post-event. Thank you. My time has expired. Now I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Glacken, I just want to cover a little bit of territory with you. I, I know that there was some speculation when the H.R. 1, the so-called fiscal year 11 uh, proposal, was originally presented and was aiming to cut 16 percent of NOAA's budget, particularly that area devoted to operations, research and facilities, which would in fact fund some of the things that you have been talking about here today, uh, including the, the, uh, the dot boys uh, that are currently inoperative and, and the ability to maintain and repair them. Uh, do we still run that risk? And how much of, of a budget cut could you sustain without running that type of risk, which seems to me to be quite serious? So um, we're, uh, we were much relieved to see the numbers this week compared to H.R. 1 in allowing us to be able to resource some of our critical operations. Uh, we're in the process of putting together a spend plan uh, in terms of going forward in this. And um, I think even importantly, getting some stability in the full year funding is important because we need to get out there with our ships and and uh, maintain some of our buoys, which we will be able to do once we all hope, I think, there is successful action this week on an appropriation. Well, I, I take it that the fact that you suspended the maintenance uh, and detection infrastructure repair uh, on, on that basis would have indicated that 16 percent was certainly going to require yeah. that you cut some. That is right. Okay. That is right. And now you are looking to see how much you have to cut, or is there a chance that you are not going to have to cut yeah, anything? I, I think it is premature for me to say. We have challenges, certainly, at the funding level uh, that is presented to us. And NOAA uh, is working within the administration to develop a spend plan, which we will you know, bring up for, for approval in Congress. So I think that is one of the we will have tough choices to make in that, but it is premature to say what they would be. Okay. Now, the nine DART boys that are currently inoperative, how long have they been inoperative? Um, so let me say a few words about that. Our DART buoy network is designed with some redundancy in it. I would assume. Uh, so, yeah. Yes, because you have them off the coast of Alaska. They will fail because sometimes the weather, you know, just mm -hmm. pulls the moorings out and things like that. What we like to do is get out there as soon as possible when we get good weather. Uh, get our ships out there and get those repaired. So we have been delayed in doing that this year um, because of the lack of funding situation. So with the stability and funding going, we will be able to get those ships out there and get them repaired. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from Idaho, uh, Mr. Labrador. Thank you. Thanks for taking the time, and also thanks for waiting uh, for a long time. We've been uh, we've had a hectic day, and I know it's been difficult for you waiting. So I appreciate that, um, Dr. Lee. Am I saying that correctly? In your testimony, you state that the West Coast of the United States, Hawaii, and the Pacific territories are all at risk for damage from tsunamis generated by distant earthquakes. How do you think, and Ms. Glock, and how, how do risk of such destructive tsunamis for the United States compare to what we have just seen in Japan historically? And can you describe the potential damage that would result, and are we prepared as a nation? The, the, um, the example that I like to give in terms of the, the risk that we face is um, from, coming from Alaska, a known uh, zone which can produce very large earthquakes and tsunami, is that uh, we have had tsunamogenic earthquakes in the 1920s and 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, but we have not had any since the 1960s. So we're, we're in, a, in a situation the earth is quite unpredictable in, gen in its generation, the timeliness of its generation of earthquakes. And uh, what I would say as an earth scientist is that that stress is building up and that we are, you know, we can expect another tsunami coming from Alaska. So. Um, 
I can't com comment, and it's outside of the work of our agency in terms of the preparedness on the coastline for that. Um, but we are working with NOAA and FEMA and developing scenarios for a large earthquake uh, generated in Alaska and its impact all the way down on the coast. USGS provides the scientific basis um, for that scenario. And then the other, the other partners, um, federal, uh, state, and local, take it from there to evaluate the impacts. Ms. Glocken. Thank you. Uh, I think all of us appreciate this committee um, taking the time to have this hearing because I think um, what we can't afford as a nature, nation is complacency. And that's the danger with events that are infrequent like tsunamis. I think with respect to the vulnerability in this uh, country, that our ability to put out warnings uh, as long as we are able to sustain our infrastructure that is there, I feel good about. I think that there is a real challenge, though, in keeping uh, the local communities ready to respond for this. And I really want to make the point to this committee that is in my written testimony, but I didn't say here, is when you have these local tsunamis, you really need to know to move and not wait for the warning. You know, people have to be trained and attuned that when that ground is shaking and the water is receding, you move. You are not waiting for your cell phone to tell you something. And the fact that this is at the coastline where we have so many visitors, um, you know, populations swell there, people are unfamiliar with roads, it is incredibly important uh, that they are able to move from that coastline and know what to do. So that is going to take a continued, I think, investment and attention uh, at all levels of government. Thank you. And to follow up on that comment, Mr. Murphy, and I am going to ask the question of all the panelists, what can we do to improve warning and response times? I think probably, and I would agree with Ms. Glacken, uh, we can never be too prepared. Uh, as you uh, might well imagine, we have so many visitors on the Pacific Coast, uh, both in uh, Ms. Ward's region and mine, uh, that you never can uh, over-educate the people. And I think it is something that you have to consistently do. Uh, you clearly have to partner with everybody. Uh, in FEMA, we have uh, taken an initiative called the Whole of Community, and you really have to share resources uh, and make everybody part of that team. I can tell you that in some of our states in Region 10, uh, Oregon and Washington, uh, you have to partner with the Hotel Association and get them to make some investments about teaching their uh, visitors that stay in their facilities what to do, because somebody you know, from a, a landlocked state or part of the country may not understand what you need to do in a tsunami. I know we promote really uh, don't drive, you go up a hill or things like that, and try and teach them some things. And of course, basic preparedness. Tsunami that hit Japan, and we do know the impact of what your warning systems meant for the people of Hawaii. We were very fortunate. We had no deaths. We did have property damage, but I credit that to really how well it operates. And uh, because of that, I asked to be permitted to sit here. My main concern, of course, first, and I guess we can start with um, Ms. Glacken, is to discover the NOAA budget, which is presently scheduled to be uh, cut. Uh, what impact will that have on, for example, the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center? I know in reading your statement uh, you felt that, that the continuing resolution has had an impact in terms of the darts not being able to be repaired and so forth, and I think you said nine are inoperative at this time. So can you tell me exactly what impact it would have at the present funding level? Um. With the, um, the proposed funding level of the bill that is under consideration now does present challenges for NOAA in terms we will have some very tough choices in front of us given the breadth of activities that we have and the many critical services we provide. Um, you know, I didn't, didn't go into it here, but mentioned elsewhere is things like hurricane services, uh, severe weather. We have flooding going on in the country now in the um, north central part of the country and dams that are in danger of, uh, of failing there. So we will have very tough challenges in front of us. It is premature to say, uh, and I am not able to today because decisions haven't been made about how we will make all of those decisions, but we are anxious. Uh, getting the DART buoys repaired is, is near, I can tell you, is near the top of our list. So I expect to see action on that um, shortly after getting, you know, getting this next 
pot of money in our, uh, in our checkbooks in NOAA. Ms. Clarkin, the issue of the darts, and I think your testimony or your written testimony stated that there are nine that are inoperative. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell me where those nine are located? Um, they are along Alaska, along the Aleutian Islands, and um, well, my, I got a little map here that will tell me exactly that. Is that the map in your testimony? Yes, it is the map in the testimony. Um, so there is one on the Aleutians, there is one uh, off, of the, off of the Puget Sound out that way. Um, they are off uh, in the territories um, 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 off of, um, I am sorry, in the midway between Hawaii and Japan. And then there are several, one in the Caribbean, one off of the Atlantic coast, and two down towards um, uh, Australia. So are those the ones in red? Yes. In your map? Yes. Now, can you explain, I uh, have only got a minute uh, plus here, that in Hawaii that killed about 159 people, and the biggest one that hit Alaska were off the Aleutian Islands, weren't they? Yes, that is correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, I would like to now recognize, my, recognize myself for another five minutes. Uh, uh, Mr. Madden, you are right there on the front lines. You have testified uh, that in terms of your uh, interaction uh, that things are as they are supposed to be. But this is a, a golden opportunity to suggest crystal clear for, for the committee and for the Congress what it is you, you think is missing from what the Federal Government is providing you in terms of information, et cetera. Mr. Chair, there, there are two items on that. One is that the emphasis so far has been on the seismic generated uh, uh, tsunamis. The major killer in 1964 were the local tsunamis. The earthquake caused half of a mountain to slide down into the water. The water then proceeded in, not at a 33 feet height, but at a 200 feet height. And that gives almost no notice. So it is the shaking of the ground which is the only notice that the people have. And that is why that preparedness is, is so important. The second part is that uh, during this event, I am fortunate that the uh, West Coast and Alaska Tsunami Warning Center is only 40 miles from my emergency operations center. I put a person in that center with a cell phone and a radio just in case something happened. And in this event, there is so much worldwide interest that the website could no longer put out their notices. They were still putting it out by fax and other means, but it, they lacked the bandwidth to fully accommodate all of the interest and all of the, uh, the system's demand. We accommodated that within our state. That was served us. Had it been longer than that, we were standing ready to contact our counterparts in Hawaii to act as that go-between. Uh, so it is communications system, bandwidth and enough capacity to handle a worldwide interest item, and that public education that for those coastal community, communities, if the earth shakes, don't wait, go to higher ground. And that is the only way that the local tsunamis uh, threat will be reduced and save lives. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Ward, we don't have California represented, and that is, I believe, uh, uh, part of your region. What, from your perspective, the Federal Government perspective, what are the States doing right or wrong? How, how, how well prepared are they? Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, along with my counterparts in Region 10 and the State of Alaska, uh, th they are doing the things that they need to do to, to get out the preparedness campaign, uh, all hazards. And, and we, we have a couple of things that uh, Tsunami Awareness Week that ironically was just last week. Uh, and we do all hazards and catastrophic planning that we have focused on for the last several years uh, uh, significantly. Uh, while some of those uh, plans have focused on earthquake specific, what we used and what we saw just recently for the State of Hawaii as, a, as an example is that that planning, we used that specific plan that was for a Cat 5 hurricane hitting Honolulu, we used the same elements of that plan, those checklists, to start our uh, response activities for this event. So we feel that they are doing uh, what they need to be doing in partnership with all of us uh, for preparing. But as you have heard uh, from the panel, the, the complacency of, of preparedness, a 
especially in a, an event or scenario that doesn't happen very often but that can have devastating effects to coastlines where we all share, uh, at least at this end of the table, with tourists who come uh, you know, now and then to a place where they may not be as, uh, as aware of these types of, of uh, risks. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge and a balance to keep that uh, preparedness. Uh, from your perspective, Ms. Ward and Mr. Murphy, are any of the States not doing what they are supposed to be doing? From your perspective, your professional perspective, are any of them that are lagging behind or just ignoring what uh, the threat? Uh Mr. Chairman, I would say no, but I would also uh, caution that in these economic times for State governments and our territorial governments, that it is a challenge to prioritize these types of, of activities, but it is certainly a priority for all of my States and territories. Thank you. And, and as we kind of wrap up here, maybe you could just, uh, we will start with Mr. Madden, just the number one thing you would like to see happen moving forward. The ability for communities to make informed decisions requires the network and on the training and exercise uh, for them. So it is continuous uh, emphasis on the individual and the community's decision making. Thank you. Mr. Murphy? I would concur with Mr. Madden, but I would also say that we need to continue to improve and escalate our efforts in catastrophic planning. Uh, if we really did have something that would hit the entire West Coast, uh, you know, you really need a plan that will deal with that. So more and continued work. And I would agree with both of them and add that the, the emphasis on personal preparedness for a plethora of risk is extremely important. Yeah, I think what I would say is uh, sustainment and improvement of the uh, services we have now. And going to your first question, Mr. Chairman, I would say your point about really having the overall national assessment of tsunami risk done for the nation um, so that we are ensuring that we are covering everything that needs to be done. Uh, thank you. I, I would um, I'll come in from the technical and scientific side and say that I would very much like to see uh, the completion of a uh, seismic network and delivery system in the United States, a modern one that replaces the one that was built over the decades at the last part of the nat uh, previous century. Oh, very good. Listen, thank you all for, for attending. For, please, if there are additional comments that you wish to submit, uh, information that you can provide the committee, we would certainly appreciate that. Your full testimony, uh, if you weren't able to get through all, will be submitted again for the record. We appreciate the great length and time. We appreciate the your, uh, your understanding, we started a bit late given the votes on the floor, and uh, particularly Mr. Madden, who traveled such a great distance. Uh, we appreciate you all being here. The great work that you do, it is a thankless job in many ways, but uh, so vital uh, when, when that uh, you know, disaster is hit. So appreciate your dedication and your work for, for our country, and, and thank you for being here. At this time, the committee stands adjourned.